So I'm Jeff Stone, professor at the law school. If you don't know that by now, you probably shouldn't be in this room. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is the Supreme Court confirmation process. And, and this talk derives from a, a piece I published in the Supreme Court Review um, recently. Um, and it arose out of pure curiosity on my part about uh, the Kagan nomination. And I've watched Supreme Court nominations and confirmation processes for a long time, but I never really had, had thought hard about um, the nature of the process and particularly how it has changed over time. Um, the conventional wisdom is that these processes have in fact changed over time. And I was curious about A, whether that's true, and B, to what extent, and C, what was the cause of the change um, if there is such a change. And so this is really the product of that curiosity on my part. Uh, I, should, I should tell you that, that this is my virgin voyage with uh, PowerPoint. Um, I know, I know, I know. I mean, I'm still a sort of blackboard and chalk guy, and I'm, I'm still uneasy when I have to use a whiteboard. Uh, so this is a whole new era for me. I know all my colleagues do this, and I'm the last one to do it. And so if I screw it up, um, be patient. Uh, OK, so to begin with, I was curious about the changes or lack of change in the confirmation process over time. Um, Throughout American history, uh, the Senate has voted on 129 Supreme Court nominees. Um, of those, 117, or 91 percent, were confirmed, and 12 or 9 percent were rejected. So I was curious whether there's been a change over the 200 plus years of American history. So, ha, how about that? <laughs> so figure one divides American history into four 55-year periods. Um, and as you can see, um, it's not the most recent period that is in any way out of the ordinary. Uh, rather, it's the period from 1900 to 1955 that's the outlier. Um, indeed, the current period only seems out of the ordinary to us um, because of the dramatic change from the preceding period. But then I was curious, well, what was going on in, from 1900 to 19? to produce this very different um, rate of, of confirmation. Um, and the answer on, on investigation turned out to be pretty clear. Um, at the time of every Supreme Court nomination between 1900 and 1955, the president and the majority of the Senate were from the same political party. And not surprisingly, the likelihood that the Senate will reject a nominee is much greater when the president is not of the same political party as the Senate. Indeed, all three nominees whose confirmation was denied by the Senate between 1955 and 2010 were nominated by a president whose party did not control the Senate. And indeed, five of the six nominees who were denied confirmation since 1870 were nominated by a president to an opposing party Senate. Moreover, as shown by figure two, in the past 55 years, the last quartile, 100% of nominees presented by a president whose party controlled the Senate were confirmed, 13 of 13, whereas only 80% of those nominated by a president whose party did not control the Senate have been confirmed, 12 of 15. So contrary to expectations, at least from this picture, there seems to be nothing at all out of the ordinary about the last 55 years. Okay, the next question that I turn to, having decided that this is uninteresting after all, um, was what is it that leads members of the Senate to oppose Supreme Court nominees? And with a little research, I discovered that, first of all, as revealed in figure three, that members of the Senate take a nominee's qualifications seriously. That is, according to studies done by political scientists, in the period 1950 to 2000, eight nominees were perceived as most qualified, including Scalia, Brennan, and Ginsburg, 
And those eight nominees were confirmed by an average of 95% of the vote. By contrast, the six nominees who were perceived as least qualified, including White, Carswell, and Thomas, received only 61% of the vote. Those perceived as having average qualifications, such as Berger, Breyer, and Souter, received on average 86% of the vote. So it's fair to say that the perceived excellence or lack of excellence or relative excellence of the nominee matters to members of the Senate, and that's a good thing. Okay, a second consideration, it turns out, that matters to members of the Senate, not surprisingly, is ideology. As figure four shows, those nominees perceived as having strongly ideological views, such as Thurgood Marshall, William Rehnquist, uh, Clarence Thomas, Ruth Ginsburg, uh, Samuel Alito, received on average 77% affirmative votes, whereas those nominees who were perceived as having more moderate views, such as Stevens, O'Connor, Souter, and Breyer, received 96% favorable votes for confirmation. So obviously, the more intense a nominee's perceived ideology, the greater the likelihood that members of the Senate will vote against. Another factor that helps explain how individual senators vote concerns ideological compatibility between the senator and the nominee. As figure five reveals, senators vote to confirm 98% of the time when they are ideologically aligned with the nominee, but only 42% of the time when they are ideologically at odds with the nominee. So up to this point, we can see that senators are more likely to vote against the nominee if they believe the nominee is less than highly qualified, if they believe the nominee is highly ideological, or if they strongly disagree with the nominee's ideology. Now, further investigation led me to discover that there's a fourth factor that enters the picture, not surprising. Um, as revealed in figure six, senators care about the impact of the appointment on the existing makeup of the court. That is, even a highly ideological nominee like Scalia or Brennan is likely to be approved without much fuss if the confirmation is not expected to change the ideological makeup of the court. As a general rule, conservatives won't go to the mat to defeat a liberal who replaces a liberal, and liberals generally won't go to the mat to defeat a conservative who replaces a conservative. It's when a conservative is nominated to replace a liberal or a liberal is nominated to replace a conservative that things really light up. In that vein, imagine what will happen if President Obama is reelected in 2012 and he has the opportunity to nominate someone to replace one of the five conservative justices who currently make up the majority of the Supreme Court. Uh, that will be a nightmare. Okay, so let's change direction a bit and talk about the current state of affairs. So the conventional wisdom is that there was a sharp change in the nature of the confirmation and nomination processes in the wake of the Bork nomination. To refresh your memory, Robert Bork is an alum of this law school who went on to become a distinguished professor at Yale and then Richard Nixon's solicitor general. In that capacity, Bork famously fired special prosecutor Archibald Cox at Richard Nixon's direction. Cox was investigating Watergate, and when Nixon decided that Cox had gone too far, he ordered the Attorney General, Elliot Richardson, to fire him. Both Richardson and the Associate Attorney General, William Ruckelshaus, refused to do so and resigned, believing that was an abuse of power. Nixon's order then worked its way down to Bork, who as Solicitor General was the number three person in the Department of Justice, and Bork did as, Nixon's, uh, as Nixon directed, 
um, and fire at Cox in what became known as the Saturday Night Massacre. Um, and as you can imagine, Bork uh, was not, as a consequence of that, a very popular figure in substantial segments of this nation, um, having done so, particularly because he didn't resign after doing it. Um, after leaving office, um, Bork returned to Yale, helped found the Federalist Society, was a leading champion of the theory of originalism, and was then appointed by President Reagan in 1982 to the D.C. Circuit. Five years later, Reagan nominated Bork to the Supreme Court to replace the moderate Justice Lewis Powell, who was then retiring. In a bruising confirmation battle, Democrats argued that Bork's ideology, which included the rejection of any constitutional right of privacy, was outside the mainstream of American constitutional thought. In addition, Bork didn't do himself any favor by being willing to answer far too many questions and doing so in a manner that was often perceived as uh, extraordinarily arrogant. His nomination was defeated by a vote of 58 to 42, with two Democrats voting for confirmation and six Republicans voting against. The standard story is that the Bork confirmation battle fundamentally changed the process ever since, making it much more ideological and contentious than ever before. So I was curious in all this to figure out, well, is, is that actually the case? Can one demonstrate whether that's true or not? So to get at that question, um, I, I decided to focus on the period 1964 to 2010, which is just 23 years after and 23 years before the Bork nomination. Um, what figure seven shows is that what is generally understood to be a, a much more politicized process post-Bork <coughs> turns out not to be evident in the outcome of the confirmation processes. That is, in the pre-Bork period, from 64 to 87, the Senate confirmed 10 of 12 nominees, whereas in the post-Bork period, the Senate has confirmed nine of nine nominees. So at least on its face, that seems to suggest that this fuss over the Bork nomination may really be no much ado about nothing. But on a closer examination, it becomes more complicated. So as figure eight reveals, in the post-Bork era, senators cast 82% of their votes to confirm, I'm sorry, in the pre-Bork era, Senators cast 82% of their votes to confirm, whereas in the post-Bork era, they cast only 77% of their votes to confirm. That suggests that the Bork nomination may indeed have had some impact on the deference that senators traditionally have brought to the uh, confirmation process, a slight reduction in the percentage of positive votes. On the other hand, as figure nine reveals, there's clearly been a change in partisan voting. And this is more dramatic. Um, in the pre-Bork era, senators voted 66% of the time to confirm can candidates nominated by a president of the opposing party, whereas in the post-Bork era, this figure has fallen to 55%. Similarly, as figure 10 shows, in the pre-Bork era, senators voted to confirm candidates nominated by a president of their own party 92% of the time, whereas in the post-Bork era, they voted to confirm such nominees 99% of the time. So figures 9 and 10 both suggest that senators have indeed become more partisan in their voting on nominees, both being less deferential to the president when, when they are of the opposing party and more embracing of the president's nominees when they are of the president's party. Figure 11 shows another measure of the possible impact of the Bork confirmation mess, and that's the average margin of victory of those nominees who were confirmed. In the 10 pre-Bork confirmations, the average margin of victory was 72 votes, whereas in the nine post-Bork confirmations, the average margin of victory had shrunk to only 54 votes. 
So this suggests an appreciable shift in the willingness of senators, again, to defer to the president, even in those circumstances where their votes are not going to affect the outcome. That is, something's driving them to oppose, even though they know they're not going to defeat the nomination. Now, these changes in the grand scheme of things may seem relatively small, um, but there's another factor worth taking into account that makes them somewhat more dramatic. As we saw, senators are much more likely to vote against nominees whom they perceive to be highly ideological. After his defeat in the Senate, Bork predicted that his failed confirmation would cause presidents in the future to select nominees whose views were less controversial. And the evidence seems to support Bork's prediction. As figure 12 shows, 10 of the 12 pre-Bork nominees were thought to have strongly ideological views at the time that they were nominated, whereas only three of the nine post-Bork nominees were thought to have strongly held ideological views, Thomas, Roberts, and Alito. That shift from 83% strongly held ideological views to only 33% is certainly consistent with Bork's prediction. Moreover, it also suggests that the increase in negative voting post-Bork is especially striking, given the fact that the central reason for opposition is ordinarily connected to the strength of the ideological views of the nominees. And here, the nominees are less highly ideological, which would have led to a prediction of fewer negative votes. So the fact that we have a modest shift against confirmation is even more dramatic given the fact that the nominees are less objectionable based on the strength of their ideological convictions. So the conclusion I reached from all this is that the Bork um, uh, nomination did indeed have an impact, uh, maybe not quite as profound as some people thought, but clearly an impact uh, that's demonstrated by these various data. A closer look, though, revealed that it's more complicated than that. So to dig deeper, I divided the post-Bork era into two periods, 1987 to 2000 and 2000 to 2010. And it turned out that this revealed some really interesting differences. Figure 13 compares the percentage of opposing party positive votes in the two post-Bork periods. In the five nominations between 1987 and 2000, senators from the opposing party cast 73% of their votes to confirm. In the four nominations between 2000 and 2010, senators of the opposing party cast only 26% of their votes to confirm. Now, this is a dramatic change, and it occurs not post-Bork, which, as you can see, actually went up from the pre-Bork period, um, but rather only since the year 2000. So this was clearly worth further inquiry. Turns out that the same effect is evident in the average margin of victory data. As we saw earlier, the average margin of victory declined from 72 to 54 after the Bork nomination. But as figure 14 shows, all of this drop-off occurred post-2000. Right? So the question then arises, why did this happen? Right? What's going on post-2000 rather than post-Bork that really is engaged, is involved in what seems to be this dramatic change in the confirmation process. Much more dramatic if you look post-2000 than if you look post-Bork, and all of the change post-Bork is actually post-2000. So, well, one possible explanation is that the presidents put forth more highly ide ideological nominees post-2000 than they did in the earlier period, but this turns out not to be the case. As figure 15 reveals the sharp increase in negative voting after 2000 occurred even though President George W. Bush and Barack Obama uh, 
nominated candidates who were, on average, no more ideological than those candidates who'd been nominated between 1987 and 2000, and indeed less ideological than the average nominees in the pre-Bork era. Figure 17 also reaffirms that from a different measure. So the much greater level of contentiousness in the Senate post-2000 right, cannot be explained by the intensity of the ideologi ideology of the nominees. There's been no appreciable change on that score. So that still leaves the question, what explains the much greater negativity post-2000? Another possibility is that even if the post-2000 nominees were not thought to be unusually extreme as a group, that their confirmations nonetheless threatened to change the ideological balance on the court. Because as we've seen, that's a factor that clearly leads to greater opposition. But as revealed in figure 18, the average expected ideological change in the court for nominees between 1964 and 2000 was much greater than the average change expected for nominees post-2000. Roberts for Rehnquist, Alito for O'Connor, Sotomayor for Souter, and Kagan for Stevens were all perceived at the time of nomination as more or less at wash, even though it turns out that Alito for O'Connor turned out to have greater consequences than I think people thought at the time. So if neither the intensity of the ideology of the nominees nor their expected impact on the ideological balance of the court can explain the dramatic shift in behavior post-2000, right, we're still left looking for some explanation for this phenomenon. Now, it's possible, of course, that this is merely a statistical tick, that we're only dealing here with four nominations. And it may be that when we look back 10, 15, 20 years from now, uh, there'll, be, there'll be no consequence attached historically to this shift. I rather suspect that's not the case. Um, if you look historically, you don't see any kind of changes of this magnitude coming out of nowhere. Um, and so I'm strongly of the view that what we're seeing here is some real change in the process um, that will be with us for the indefinite future. But the question still is why? Right? What, what caused it? Um, so another possibility is the growing perception of the Supreme Court as a political institution, right? Before Brown versus the Board of Education, the court occasionally addressed hot button issues, but prior to Brown, those decisions were relatively rare. Since 1954, however, the court has increasingly found itself embroiled in a broad range of politically important and divisive issues, including school prayer, various criminal procedure issues, the death penalty, abortion, gun control, obscenity, gay rights, affirmative action, and the like. It makes sense that members of the Senate would be much less willing to defer to the president in his nominations to the Supreme Court in an environment in which it is understood that the court is making decisions about these much more highly ideological, controversial, and important issues. The problem with this hypothesis is that from 1955 to 2000, the number of negative votes actually trended down, despite the fact that during that period, the court's engagement with controversial and ideologically loaded questions clearly trended up. And so it does not seem that that can be the explanation for post-2000. Whatever's happened post-2000, it's generally just a continuation of a trend that's gone on for at least since 1955. And there's no evidence, somewhat surprisingly, that that factor has played much of a role in the process. Now, a variant on that is the fact that the most divisive of the court's post-Bork decisions since 1987 is Bush versus Gore, which clearly highlighted the ideological inclinations of the court and of the justices in a very visible, very public way. And it may be that the very fact that Bush versus Gore intensified the public's concerns about interest in 
the court, which then translated itself into senators. And that's probably a factor, but it's probably not strong enough a factor to explain anything like this kind of a shift. Um, another possible factor is media coverage. And here I think we come increasingly close to the explanation. Historically, the confirmation process was largely invisible and had little political salience. Today, the news media cover Supreme Court nominees as they do presidential candidates. And senators, presidents, and nominees are all acutely aware that television cameras are beaming their images worldwide all the time. Today, even before presidents identify a nominee, pundits scramble to suggest questions for members of the Senate to ask, cable channels prepare to provide ga ga gavel to gavel coverage, and people eagerly await the opportunity to watch the hearings to see whether the nominee will survive. Um, in recent years, hearings have been described as um, having taken on the quality of uh, a high stakes reality TV show. Supreme Court justices did not testify before Congress, except two exceptions who requested the opportunity to testify. Um, until 1955, when John Marshall Harlan was first commanded to testify. Uh, that arose after Brown v. the Board of Education, because Southern senators wanted to test the, the views of, of nominees to make sure they weren't going to be pro-Brown. Um, the first Supreme Court justice to testify um, in televised hearings was Sandra Day O'Connor in 1981, and those hearings were broadcast only on public television. Today, the hearings can be seen on numerous cable and broadcast channels, as well as all over the internet. By the time the Senate votes today, Americans have been bombarded with countless news and talk shows, newspaper and magazine articles, and emails and blog posts concerning the nomination. Indeed, in 2005, 50% of all Americans said that they regarded the identity of the next Supreme Court justice as very important to them personally. 25 years earlier, that would have been completely implausible. And those who regard the identity of the next Supreme Court justice as important have been more than willing to make their views known to members of the Senate. And so another significant factor in all this is clearly the impact of interest groups. As shown in figure 19, the last slide, um, there's been a dramatic increase in interest, interest group participation in the confirmation process. An average of two interest groups participated in the hearings between 1952 and 1967. Today, the number is averaging around 100. Not only did these groups attempt directly to persuade senators to their political points of view about who is an acceptable and who's not an acceptable justice, but they often carry out aggressive public relations campaigns to gather support by portraying nominees as either harmful or helpful to the political goals of their members. And senators pay careful attention to these groups because they communicate directly with constituents, they raise substantial funds for political campaigns, and they can help make or break a re-election campaign. A senator who ignores these groups clearly does so at her own peril. Another factor that seems to have exacerbated the situation, in addition to the media and the interest groups and the, and the, 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 the role of, of focus on these questions in the electoral process, um, is the extraordinary politicization and polarization of the political process itself, wholly apart from the issue of confirmation. So in 1970, moderates constituted 41% of the Senate, according to political science data. Today, they constitute less than 5% of the Senate. The center of American politics has all but disappeared, at least with respect to elected officials. And this has significantly ma magnified the effects of the other factors. So with a heightened public awareness of the role of the Supreme Court, a heightened public awareness of the ideological nature of the court's decision making, mechanisms such as cable news and the internet, and energetic interest groups to bring public and political pressure to bear 
on members of the Senate, uh, and a political environment that is increasingly polarized, the traditional understanding that senators should give the benefit of the doubt to the president and should defer whenever reasonably possible has largely fallen by the boards. The magnitude of the change is evident in the two most recent confirmations of Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan. Each of these nominees shared three essential characteristics. Each was perceived as qualified. Each was perceived as relatively ideological moderate. And neither nomination threatened any significant change in the ideo ideological makeup of the court. Sotomayor for Souter and Kagan for Stevens. If anything, they moved the court slightly to the right. In such circumstances, a rather straightforward confirmation, given historical experience, should have followed in both cases. Indeed, between 1955 and 2010, a total of 12 nominees shared those three characteristics. All of them, of course, were confirmed. But the 10 who were confirmed before 2000 were confirmed with an average of only four negative votes. And that reflects the traditional senatorial deference given to the president who nominates moderate and reasonable presidential uh, nominees who are not likely to change the ideology of the court. Sotomayor and Kagan, however, were greeted with an average of 34 negative votes. And the difference between the four negative votes for the 10 pre-2000 nominees and the average of 34 negative votes in the two most recent nominees is a good measure of the magnitude of the recent polarization and politicization of the confirmation process. So finally, what does all this tell us about the future? Well, first there's a situation where the Senate is controlled by the same party as the president. As we've seen historically, it is almost always the case that in that situation, the president's nominee is confirmed. And even if the opposing party today is much more likely to vote negatively, that's still not likely to actually cause the defeat of the nomination as long as members of the president's party don't defect, which happens occasionally. Um, and usually when it does, there's reasonable ground for it. Um, but everything else being equal, what it will create is a lot of sound and fury, but not necessarily any change in the outcome of the process. On the other hand, there is a more subtle effect, and that's that presidents generally want their nominees to be confirmed, if possible, by acclamation. That's not going to happen anymore, but they want them to be confirmed enthusiastically. That's a way of selling themselves to the public as being responsible and an effective president. And so even though they might succeed in a confirmation, it is likely that they will tend to shy away from more ideological nominees and incline towards more moderate nominees in order to avoid stirring up a hornet's nest in the political world. And indeed, that probably explains why President Obama nominated two very moderate liberals, like Sotomayor and Kagan, rather than a more traditional liberal, who would have clearly created much more of a fuss, even though he controlled the Senate by a vote of 59 to 41. He just didn't want to spend any political chips if he could avoid it on appointing Supreme Court justices. So one effect of this, even where the Senate and the President are in the same hands, is it's likely to cause a greater degree of moderation in the ideological inclinations of Supreme Court nominees. And whether that's good or bad is something we can talk about or you can think about. Second, there's a situation where the Senate is in the opposing party's hands. And here, traditionally, 80% of the time we saw, um, the Senate confirms, even though it's clearly not the person they would have appointed. But they give deference to the president, 
And unless there's a serious doubt about qualifications, or unless there's a serious doubt about ideology, or dramatic change in the makeup of the court, even in that situation, the opposing party Senate, historically, has been strongly inclined to grant confirmation. Um, those days may well be over. Everything suggests that we're headed very much in a different direction there. And that when the opposing party controls the Senate, it's likely to be exceedingly difficult for a president to get anyone confirmed. And presumably, the party in control of the Senate will not completely refuse to confirm anyone. That would be politically probably a bad thing to do. Um, but they will be tempted to go as far as they can along those directions, because the presumption of deference now seems to have gone largely by the boards. And so that situation is likely to be extremely contentious and, again, driven very much towards moderate or stealth nominees. Now, there's one other factor here, which is really the gorilla in the room, and that's the filibuster. Historically, the filibuster, although used for legislation, has not been used for judicial nominations. The first time the filibuster was used in any judicial nomination was 1968, when Republicans and some Southern Democrats invoked the filibuster to block President Lyndon Johnson's nomination of sitting justice Abe Fortas to be promoted to chief justice. And they succeeded in getting Johnson to drop the nomination uh, by uh, using the filibuster. In the years since then, the use of the filibuster in lower court nominations, which was first used in 1980, has become, I'm sorry, in 19, 1980, um, has become much more common. And even though most people who are filibustered eventually get confirmed, the use of the filibuster is no longer thought in, in lower court confirmations to be particularly shocking. Even though members of the Senate inconsistently, the same members of the Senate inconsistently will defend or attack the use of the judicial filibuster depending upon whose ox is being gored. When it gets to Supreme Court nominees going forward, I think one will see the use of the filibuster much more often or the threat of the filibuster much more often than ever has been true in the past, um, because partly because political and interest groups will demand that senators block this nomination. So even in the situation going forward where the president is in control of the Senate, if the president tries to appoint anyone who's not very moderate, or tries to appoint anyone who even is relatively moderate, but who would replace a justice with the clearly opposing ideology on the other side of the, set of the center of the spectrum, one can expect the threat of the filibuster or the reality of the filibuster become, become almost paralyzing in the process. So looking forward, I think what we can expect is an ugly process in which what's really happened is members of the Senate who used to be governed by the assumption of deference have largely abandoned that assumption and are now prepared to vote on senators for much, on, on nominations, much more for political reasons, focused partly on the ideology of the nominees and partly on the pure political stakes for them individually in the process. And the one thing one can clearly predict out of this is a much more moderate set of nominees in the future. And again, whether that's good or bad remains to be seen. Okay, with that, I think I'll stop and take questions. Questions? Yes. So is there anything we can learn from Harry Meyer's nomination? Or does that not really fit with the calculus? Well, it never went to the Senate, so it's not in these data. Um, so the question is, is there anything you can learn from Harriet Myers' nomination? Well, first of all, it's not great to be Harriet Myers. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, what happened there is George Bush went off the reservation. I mean, he just sort of decided on his own, I like this person, she's a woman, I'm going to nominate her. And she's my friend, she's worked with me for a number of years, um, and so I'm going I'm to appoint somebody who's, you know, who's a good, good guy. And Myers was killed 
predominantly by the conservatives. Right? I mean, their view was, what are you doing appointing somebody about whom we know next to nothing and who has weak qualifications for the court um, and who very likely is not going to be the kind of ideologically reliable justice like a Roberts or Alito that we want on the court. So the, the real lesson of the Harriet Meyer situation, I think, is the president shouldn't do that. Uh, the president should actually pay attention to this appointment of a Supreme Court justice and not wake up in the middle of the night and say, um, you know, honey, I think I'm going to nominate Harriet, <laughs> which seems to have been what happened in, in, in Bush's case. So, Go ahead. Sorry. Um, so going off of the Harriet Myers question, it seems like since then the vetting process for Supreme Court justices has gotten much longer and the media has had more time to pick up on potential nominees and constituents have had more time to exert pressure on members of the Senate uh, to voice their opinions on that. Do you see in the future this extended vetting process um, making this trend more pronounced, or do you think the vetting process might get actually less transparent as a result of this? So by vetting, there are two, there are two stages of it. I'm not sure what you mean. One is in the White House before they name somebody, and the other is once the person's named before the hearings take place. So as to the first, um, no, I don't expect them to become uh, less. Quite the contrary. Because of the political stakes that are now seen to be involved, um, I think members of the, of the White House staff will be a lot more careful. They don't want to nominate somebody like a Harriet Myers and then have to withdraw it, or the way Ronald Reagan did with Doug Ginsburg and have to withdraw it. Um, they want to know exactly what they're getting into. And they know that anything in this person's background that could be in any way, shape, or form embarrassing will come to light. And they want to make sure they know what that is. And so they're very careful in the vetting process today along those lines. Um, and and to, to the extent they're able to, they want to have some understanding of the person's own judicial philosophy or views. Um, although they're, they're, they are, I think, reasonably careful about that. I mean, they don't ask people to commit to positions or anything like that. Uh, as to, so I think in that part of the process, the White House will not do what George Bush did or what Reagan did with Ginsburg. They will be very careful to avoid those kinds of fiascos. That doesn't look good to them politically. Um, and with respect to the Senate, I think the process, the pressures will be to drag the process out as long as possible by the opposing party. Right? So the president wants it over and done. Right? As, soon as, as soon as they name the person, they want them confirmed. Up or down, let's get it done now. Right? There's no gain to the president in this going on indefinitely or to the president's party. But the opposing party generally is going to want to do everything they can to make hay out of it. And so even though the Kagan and Sotomayor nominations were foregone conclusions in terms of the outcome, because of the, unless the Republicans were going to filibuster, um, which they couldn't even successfully have done because they only had 41 senators and they, some of them would have defected from them. So they couldn't have fil the filibustered, realistically. Um, they they want to do everything they can to make negative hay out of it politically. So I think the answer is it's going to be messier and longer, not shorter, in the foreseeable future. You mentioned that one of Bork's downfalls was his candor in front of the Senate and mm -hmm. his attitude. Uh, do you think it's been a trend towards sort of less and less candor in the actual hearings themselves? Thank you. That was the one thing I skipped. There. Um, so, so one of the one part of the conventional wisdom is that the Bork confirmation proceeding um, led nominees to be much more cautious and self-protective and evasive than they had been before. And it turns out, when you look at this carefully, several political scientists did this data by looking at these questions and making judgments about whether they answered the questions forthrightly or not. Um, <laughs> what it turns out is that there has been, as you can see, a slight decline in the forthrightness of answers to questions from, um, from 1968 to the present. That's the red line. Um, however, that's deceptive because 
the nature of the hearings has changed. And so what's happened now is me members of the Senate are much more likely to ask the same questions over and over again because they're on television, right? Whereas they weren't on television in 1968. So they're likely to ask over and over, what do you think about affirmative action? What do you think about um, abortion? And so if, if you're evasive to that question once, you'll be evasive to it six times. Also, these kinds of questions are much more likely to be asked than in the past, again, because they get television coverage. So it's hard to know whether that downward trending line really has any meaning. And in any event, it's not a sharply trending line. So the answer to the first question is it's not obvious that there's been a real substantive change. And in fact, if you go back and read the confirmation hearings, as I did for these earlier people, what you find is all of them were evasive in much the same way that, that nominees are today. Um, Harlan refused to answer the second question he was asked, uh, which was, this goes back even before Carswell, this goes back to 1956, um, about Brown. And Brennan refused to a answer questions uh, right off the bat about communism, uh, just saying it's not appropriate for me to answer that. Scalia, believe it or not, Scalia was asked what he thought about Marbury and Madison, and he said, I can't answer that question. So uh, so the history of, I wouldn't call it evasiveness. I would call it good judgment. I mean, my, I'm sorry, I mean good judgment not only in the sense of getting confirmed, but also good judgment in terms of being responsible. Uh, justices should not be in the position of being perceived to have committed under oath to hold certain views about matters which they later will be required to think about as justices. Because if they do, then they run the risk of being accused of having perjured themselves in order to get confirmed. And that may well affect their ability to be open-minded when they're actually deciding the, the question a year or five years or 10 years later. So I think that it, what's called evasiveness is actually wise and appropriate in this situation. Um, and, 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 and so I don't, I don't think that's a, a particularly negative thing. Uh, the, however, if you, if you look at the Bork confirmation, you can see a dramatic shift. Right, that comes down since Bork. But the reason for the shift is Bork. <laughs> right? So Bork shot his mouth off and answered all sorts of questions. His, I'm sure his handlers were cringing. Right? And that's partly what got him in trouble. Had Bork been as wise as Scalia, he would have been confirmed, despite everything else. The fact is he just alienated everybody by answering the questions he did in the way that he did. Um, and so you can see there is a, a, a slope down from there, but realistically, it all went up uh, in the context of, of Bork. So the answer is I, I think that there's probably not really any more evasiveness now than there was back in this era. Um, and any, then the slope there is largely distorted by the, the changes in the content of the hearings. Basically, justices, nominees, except for Bork and a little bit of Kennedy, never answered questions about particular issues or particular cases. And Shouldn't. Hand up. Yeah. Given what you just said, and given how contentious Bush v. Gore was, and that it sort of aired the dirty laundry of the justices, and it made it very clear that they had ideological sort of divides, do you think the pressure that this sort of creates for a president to nominate mo more moderate justices, does that represent a welcome sort of shift back to this ideal, theoretically, like completely neutral <laughs> court? Or do you think that those sort of political divides will continue? regardless of the pressure that is put on the president? So, okay, that, that's actually obviously the big question that all of this <coughs> suggests, because the, 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 the large prediction of all this is that we're going to wind up seeing much more moderate nominees in the future than we did in the past, and, uh, or at least nominees who are perceived to be more moderate at the time of nomination. Um, and the question is, is that a good or a bad thing? And you can argue that either way. Uh, my own view is that it's a bad thing. Um, I think it's a better Supreme Court to have on it people like Scalia and Thurgood Marshall um, than to have only people like um, Lewis Powell. Um, with a, a court of only moderate, careful, thoughtful people, you'll get um, very little done in constitutional law. And I think constitutional law is a central part. I think the court's responsibility to interpret and apply the Constitution is critical. And to do that, it needs to have a, a sharp exchange of ideas. I don't think you want only Scalia's and, and Marshall's on the court. 
But I think that to exclude them completely will wind up with the court playing a much more passive role than it should. Um, and I think that's probably not a healthy thing. But it's arguable. Other people might say that you, well, what you want is, you know, is calm, thoughtful, moderate wisdom in applying the Constitution. But my guess is that what you'll wind up with there is a, is a bunch of justices who basically disappear as a, as, a, as, a, as a meaningful political force in the country. And I think that would be bad. Most of the decisions that are criticized as highly I ideological, um, I think, very much withstood the test of time. There are exceptions, which remain highly controversial. But most of them, I think, have generally withstood the test of time. And they wouldn't have happened. What do you know about the topics of interest groups that our lobbying senators are interested in? And what, what are they pushing these senators on? Well, any, anything you'd imagine from the political process. There are abortion, obviously, gay rights on both sides. Um, uh, gun control is a big one. Um, affirmative action. Uh, basically, all any you know medical care. I mean, basically, it depends on the interest group, and there, there are many, many hundreds of thousands of interest groups that now exist. So, you know, labor. Um, they want somebody who's friendly to labor on the court. So it could be anything. Um, corporations, uh, chamber of commerce. Is there, is there some way to kind of game that aspect and to understand what interest groups a particular uh, candidate might fight to uh, be active? That when you say game it, what do you mean? Uh, I mean, if I'm the president and I'm going to nominate somebody to, you know, uh, to be a justice, perhaps I can take advantage of the fact that I know there will be interest groups that will lobby senators to uh, make them figure out which ones are historically more effective. And what, if there's a leading issue that tends to be the one that is most effective at lobbying senators, then I can know to prepare for that. Oh, I, I would imagine that to the extent that presidents are aware that certain interest groups are more effective at bringing along certain senators who they regard as pivotal senators in a confirmation, that they are cognizant of that. I mean, they're political animals, so I would guess they're very cognizant of that. I don't know whether it exists in the way you describe, but I would imagine that if, if it does exist, as I suspect it does, and they are aware of it, and they think they can identify certain groups who really have sway with particular swing senators, that they would pay attention to that, sure. Have you looked at uh, similar data for appellate court nominations? And would you expect to see similar trends, even though there's not as much salience or media coverage? Um, I have not looked at it. And, but there are similar trends. Um, so I, I, I haven't looked at it with this degree of detail. But certainly, the, the, the number of lower court nominations that have gotten bollocked up in the confirmation process has gone up exponentially um, over the last decade, last 15 years. Um, it used to be extremely rare, except in the last six months of a president's term, when there was always a lot of opposition. Um, but except for the end of a president's term, uh, basically, senators controlled it. Individual senators controlled it, um, if, as they still do to some degree. Um, if they didn't want someone confirmed, they would not approve it, and it wouldn't be nominated. Today, the president sometimes nominates, but the Senate respects the right of the individual senator from the state to block the nomination. Um, but it's gone up dramatically. Uh, again, for many of the same reasons, but I think obviously the, the public visibility is much, much less. And, um, but so I think it's less focused on individual nominees than it is on the, the type of nominee. So you'll have interest groups who certainly favor or oppose. Well, if Obama wants to appoint really liberal nominees, there's going to be a lot more response to it. So, so Obama's n nominated only one lower court nominee who I think was clearly identifiable as a traditional liberal. And that was Goodwin Liu, um, who is, was a professor at Berkeley. And um, Goodwin was defeated by a Republican Senate, uh, which voted against. Uh, it, entirely on, no, nobody could doubt, in fact, the, the, the qualifications of Goodwin, but on ideological grounds. Um, and Obama has been unwilling, unlike George Bush, has been unwilling to nominate more nominees of that sort. So what Bush did, for example, with lower court nominees, is he would nominate a dozen 
very conservative candidate at one time. And so even if, even if the op opponents and the Democrats in the Senate could block a couple of them and say, look, we got a victory, right? They would confirm the other eight or nine. So everybody was sort of happy. Obama's risk averseness here is captured by the fact that he's only nominated one person in the entire time he's been president that would fit that description and sort of let him ha hang out to dry because there was no way they were going to get him confirmed um, given the fact that he was out there by himself. Um, so I think that, that shows the risk averseness on the part of the, of the White House on these issues. And it definitely applies to lower courts as well. Um, all of this applies, but just in a more complicated mechanism to lower court judges. Um, you talked about how much the effect or how much media coverage of the confirmation process affected the process. And I was wondering how much do you think the effect of like media coverage of the actual decision making might affect, affect the confirmation process, such as it seems like it's more political than it really is because they put the five four decisions in the spotlight a little bit more, but frankly more interesting. But when they don't actually fall along those political lines as much, it might seem that it matters a little bit more if you get the ideology. Yeah, I think that's a good point. There was, for almost all of our history, with, with certain very notable exceptions, to the extent the media covered what the Supreme Court did at all, um, it was only in major cases, relatively major cases, and there were many fewer of them. And I think the media tended to accept the black robe idea. And today, I think the combination of many more decisions that are seen to be of public interest, that are of public interest, um, and a tendency to exaggerate the, politi the political nature of the court's business um, have definitely made this all more salient among the public. Uh, and, and part of that is the fact that the nature of the media has changed so much. I mean, again, if you go back a ways, th there was a actual responsible mains, mainline media from whom most people got their information. Now that doesn't exist anymore, and so on a whole host of issues, people are getting information from um, sources that are just much more, much less reliable, much less even-handed, um, and therefore they're likely to exaggerate the newsworthiness of a story. And so, yeah, I think, I think, I think the public gener generally does get a much more um, uh, hysterical sense of what the, the justices do than, they, than, the re than is real, which isn't to say they aren't affected by their, their different understandings of the law, and there's no doubt they are, and you can often predict the way individual justices will vote on particular cases, but it's not because they're being political in the raw sense of the word. It's that they do have certain legitimate perspectives on how you interpret the Constitution that lead them to different conclusions. And uh, whether it's Scalia on the one hand or, or Thurgood Marshall on the other, um, I think that, that what they are doing is not internally political. What they're doing is, in a, in a, in a fair-minded way, attempting to interpret the Constitution subject to a, a set of methodologies and values that they believe are appropriate to the task. But the public sees it much more as a cartoon. And, and that is a problem. That does add to the sense that, that we, we have to dictate exactly who winds up on the court. But it's also true that they do vote in relatively predictable ways, even if it's more subtle, and therefore it does matter who's on the court. You mentioned that uh, judges with high, judges highly in the altitude will got more negative votes. But we know that moderate judge, justice frequently disappoint their president, such as Justice Bradman who wrote Wade Way and Justice Conn who wrote Guter, and not to mention uh, Justice Earl Warren. So do you think it is possible that the president, you know, trying to dominate the Supreme Court ideologically will tend to nominate more ideological strong justice? Because moderate can do. Right, so the, 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 the story is that justices often disappoint the presidents who nominate them by being more liberal or more conservative than the justice who nominated them expected and hoped for. So first response to that is it's, it's true but exaggerated. So there are circumstances, certainly, in which justices have 
behaved in ways that disappointed the, the president who nominated them um, in terms of their votes. Uh, second, however, it's not that common. Right? It happens a certain percentage of the time, but not by any means always. Um, second of all, it often happens over time. So the disappointment is rarely that the justice turns around and within the first five years does things that shock the person who appointed them. Sometimes that happens, but rarely. It's rather that over time, the justice himself or herself evolves. And their views change, and their understanding of their role changes, and their understanding of the, of the, the, the methods of constitutional interpretation grow and change, because they're learning. And that may cause them to ha have different views than one would have hoped for the day they were nominated. Um, having said that, it is true that when you appoint someone who is less well-known in terms of their views, there is a risk. And the risk is that they'll behave differently than what you expect. Um, it's interesting, by the way, that the evolution is very dramatically in the liberal direction. That is, although there are a few justices who were appointed by Democratic presidents who have become more conservative than they might have been hoped to be, Wizard White being, Byron White being one of the few examples of that, the vast majority of this phenomenon turns out to be conservative nominees who turn out to be more moderate justices. And I would like to think, you know, I'm talking very personally, that that shows that they've learned. <laughs> that they've gained wisdom in their performance of their job. Um, so, so yes, there's a risk in appointing moderate nominees, and that's why uh, presidents would rather not do it. And that's why, until recently, a, a fairly high percentage of nominees were s known to be strongly ideological when they were appointed uh, to avoid this very problem. But what's happened more recently is, is, is it's much harder for presidents to get away with that. And therefore, they're inclined to be willing to take the risk, which are less certain. So Sotomayor and Kagan, one could reasonably say they're likely to incline in a liberal direction on the court. But certainly not to the extent of some other people Obama could have appointed, like Goodwin Liu, for instance. Um, and, uh, and they may change over time. But you know, that's where he felt he could get confirmed. And he didn't want to pick a fight that was going to cost him a huge amount of political capital. So from his pr perspective, that was, all things considered, you know, the best deal that he could get. Um, OK, time for one more question, if you want. Could maybe the timing in which the president is in his present term influence? Because I believe Bork was almost at the end of the presidential term. Nominations at the yeah. end of a president's term always have much more difficulty, the last year in particular. Um, and Bork was not in the last year. Bork was before that. But yes, another factor I didn't bother going into is that nominations in the last year, whether a Supreme Court or lower court, always have a diff more difficult time. Because obviously members of the Senate of the opposing party want to not confirm if they can. Now, it's very hard to not confirm Supreme Court nominees in that situation. You can, but it's been, historically, there's, there has been an inclination in that direction. But it's hard, harder to do that. With lower court nominees, it's dramatic. With, with, uh, Elena Kagan, for example, was first nominated to the DC Circuit by President Clinton um, in the last six months or nine months, I guess, of his, of his second term, and never got a vote um, because the, the Republicans in the Senate just blocked it. Uh, and that's true for a whole lot of people. And that happens every time, and that's only going to get worse going forward. Now it'll be the last three years of a term uh, <laughs> instead of last year. Okay, thank you all very much.